Good morning, church. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. This is the last Sunday of Easter, and so we stop that greeting for a while. We've greeted each other that way seven weeks now, and we'll stop that until, uh, until next year on Easter. Thurs this past Thursday marked 40 days since Easter, and that's the day that the church recognizes the ascension of Jesus, where he ascended up into heaven. And we'll be noting that at the end of our worship service tonight, th today, as we put out the Christ candle. I have some announcements as we begin. Thanks to Marilyn for playing today and filling in. You know, this, the search for a new music person is, is really uh, getting to be a challenge. It, we're kind of running up against one brick wall after another. So I would ask that you keep that in your prayers uh, for who, who God is going to send us. Raise up that person who will lead us, lead the musical part of our worship. Also, we'll be recognizing our graduates uh, a little bit later in the service. I think we have 10 high school graduates this year. I know we have three or four who could not be here today, but uh, we'll be calling them up and finding out what, what's going on in their lives. And then I need to remind you that June the 11th, um, Sunday, June the 11th, right after worship, we have a voters meeting. We don't normally have voters meetings in the summer, but a need has arisen where we need to have a voters meeting. We need to replace our boiler, our 60-year-old boiler it needs to be replaced before winter. And it's going to cost quite a bit of money, almost $200,000. And so the, the only people in the church who can acquire, who can put the church into debt are, is the voters meeting. The Deception Vision Board doesn't have that authority. And so we'll have a voters meeting on June the 11th <clears throat> to, um, to assume a, a loan, a 20-year loan, I think, to take out to, to repair the boiler or replace the boiler. And then finally, next week is Pentecost. Uh, we've, been our, our, we've had our multi-generational Sunday school today, and our, our work today was looking at the wind, at the Holy Spirit coming on Pentecost and coming as wind. And because of that, we've been, we were making kites in... Uh, in Sunday school and adult Bible class today, and those are going to be hung in the church next Sunday for Pentecost. You know, we've done for Pentecost, we've done the flames with all the red candles, a lot of different ways. We've done the languages, the language part of Pentecost, a number of different ways. But the only thing we've ever done with the wind is make a wind noise on the synth synthesizer. So next week we're going to have kites in church to talk about the wind. The, the Holy Spirit, the word in Greek and Hebrew, spirit and wind and breath are all the same word. So that, that rushing wind comes at Pentecost, and that's the wind that picks up the church and carries the church where the Holy Spirit wants us to go. So we'll note that next week. It's kind of our tradition here that we were, we're red on Pentecost, so feel free to join us in that if you like. When we get to the readings today, the, the second reading, the epistle reading from Peter. Um, there's one little phrase, one little sentence I want to pull out of that. In fact, I'll, I'll read the sentence for you now. And it's going to occupy our, our sermon time today. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Humble yourselves. We're going to look at the need for humility and the burden of pride in the life of a Christian and in the life of the church. Let's begin with prayer. Well, Father, we gather this last Sunday of the Easter season, continuing to celebrate resurrection, knowing that resurrection is our reality, knowing that eternal life is ours in Christ by his perfect life and his innocent death. But now, Lord, as we begin to move toward this season of Pentecost where your Holy Spirit comes and begins to direct your church, we pray that you'd be, you'd be pouring out that Holy Spirit on us, directing us, picking us up, and blowing us where you want us to go. And as you do that, Lord, let us respond to you in worship. In the name of Jesus, amen.
Our worship begins the way our, li- our resurrected lives begin in baptism, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. May God arise, may his enemies be scattered, may his foes flee before him. But may the righteous be glad and rejoice before God. May they be happy and joyful. A father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy dwelling. He leads out the prisoners with singing but the rebellious live in a sun-scorched land. When you, God, went out before your people, when you marched through the wilderness, the earth shook, the heavens poured down rain before God, the one of Sinai, before God, the God of Israel. You gave abundant showers, O God. You refreshed your weary inheritance. Christ is risen. Even as we glory in the gift of eternal life through Christ's death and resurrection, we realize the need for daily repentance and forgiveness. Let us confess our sins to our gracious God. Holy Spirit, continually point us to Jesus so that neither death nor the evil one nor our own sin nor love of the world can separate us from him. Cleanse us of all that would stain our lives including the sins of which we are not even aware. Then work your word in us and through us, so that others may see only Christ through and through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please rise as you are able and hear the good news. God in his mercy and grace has given you Jesus. He's given you Jesus to live perfectly and die innocently so that you may be holy and righteous and forgiven. It's my joy and privilege to stand in his stead and speak the words he commands me to speak. Because of the perfect life and perfect sacrifice of Jesus at the cross, all of your sins are are forgiven. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. God's people say, The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord, we live with one foot in the here and now and one foot in the not yet. We are citizens of both earth and heaven, the kingdom of the world and the kingdom of God. 
Make us into bringers of the kingdom and bringers of the not yet, that your kingdom comes to earth and your will is done on earth as it is in heaven. In the name of Jesus, amen. Now take this time to greet those around you, especially those you may not know. children are welcome to come forward for the children's message while you're wrapping up your greeting. Okay, maybe some children that are a little older than the children that usually come up. I need some help. And Aubrey. And Will. And PJ. Sure. And Josh, you're over there in the corner. Thank you. <laughs> you gotta have them while they're still young. <clears throat> okay, thank you for coming up. All right, I have some questions for you today. Um, if I'm gonna ask you, what is the right way to pray? Would you have an answer for me? What would be the right way to pray? Well, how do you do it? You fold your hands in front of you, okay? That's good. It might go like this. Yep. Okay, do you, so you do something specific with your hands. What about kneeling? Do you often kneel when you pray? I can't. You can't? Some of us can't. Some of us do. Some of us don't. In some churches, it's tradition to use the kneelers. We have them in our pews. We don't often use them here. But in some churches, it's more traditional to use the kneelers when there is prayer happening and people are on their knees. In our gospel lesson today, it said Jesus prayed. What do you suppose he looked like when he prayed? Without cheating, without looking at the Bible verse. Okay, we would say, fold your hands, bow your heads, close your eyes, right? Okay? That's often typically how we say to pray. And there's good reason for that, and that might be so that you're not distracted by the things going on around you. That helps bring your focus here where it needs to be between you and God. But in our Bible lesson today, it says, Jesus looked up to heaven and prayed. Do you do that? When you pray, do you, do you look up to the heavens to pray to your heavenly Father? No. Jesus did in the Bible. And that's one way to pray. Can I pray like this? Yeah, that's an okay way to pray. Can I pray like this? Yeah, I can pray when I'm doing that. Can I pray when I sit down to eat? That's a common time to pray when you're with your family. Do you do it by yourself? We've got a bunch of graduates that are taken off and leaving their family situations. Their prayer times and postures and positions might change. Okay? Maybe in the school you're going to, um, I pray that you find a group of kids that you can pray with your meal together with if you're moving off to college. Okay? I pray that in your dorm room, if that's where you're staying, that you are not inhibited by the, your roommate for prayer. That you feel free to talk to your God whenever and wherever and however often you feel moved. Jesus often went to a quiet place to pray. Sometimes in this world it's difficult to find that quiet place. But even in noisy places, we can still connect to God and connect with him often. We can pray without even using words. St. Francis of Assisi said, or it's attributed to him anyway, that um, you pray often, and if necessary, use words. Okay? 
So you can pray. Your prayer can be like this, like this, like this, like this. And God knows what's in your heart and in your minds. So today, moving forward, prayer is not just at St. Matthew. Prayer is not just in your homes with your family groups. Prayer is out on the ball fields. Prayer is in the music rooms. Prayer is in your dorm rooms. Prayer is as you're walking to and from your jobs. You can pray and talk to God at any time with any posture that's right between you and God. We're going to pray with me, and this time I'm going to ask you to fold your hands. Dear Heavenly Father, please help me to follow your example in prayer, to pray with my Heavenly Father often. Please help to connect me with you at all times. In your name I pray. Amen. Thank you. Now go back to your seats. First lesson comes from Acts chapter 1. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120, and said, Brothers and sisters, the scripture had to be fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David concerning Judas, who served as guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared in our ministry. With the payment he received for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong, his body burst open, and all his intestines spilled out. Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this, so they called that field in their language a Keldama, that is, field of blood. For, said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms, may his place be deserted. Let there be no one to dwell in it, and may another take his place of leadership. Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they nom nominated two men, Joseph, called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry, which Judas left to go where he belongs. Then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias, so he was added to the eleven. The word of the risen Lord. The epistle lesson is from 1 Peter chapter 4. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For it is time for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. 
Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you into his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. The word of the risen Lord. Please rise as you are able. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, chapter 17. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you, for I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I prayed for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. The glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. This is the gospel of our risen Lord. You may be seated. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus. Amen. Some of you know that last uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Brenda and I were at a pastor's conference. It was a very good conference up on Gull Lake. Um, the, the, the content of the conference was wonderful. We had a, a Lutheran pastor and then a, a lady who was a psychiatrist, and they were dealing, telling, t- teaching us how to deal with stress, how to deal with burnout, how to deal with um, you know, just some of the struggles that pastors go through, and that was very helpful. But uh, there was also a lot of stuff that we had to cover on our own with other pastors. And I found myself thinking again and again and again over something some pastor had said. I was thinking, you need some humility. You need a good dose of humility. It's kind of an arrogant statement, isn't it? You know, you need to be more like me, right? Um, and then uh, 
last Friday we went down to Fulda to bury Brenda's uncle, Pastor Barry Hinkey, who was just one of the most humble pastors I know, and who was just a very good pastor. And I did that service along with one of Brenda's cousins, Pastor Tom Gunderman, who's pastor at Concordia St. Paul, also a very humble pastor. And I got to see just that other side of pride, which is the power of humility. And so on Tuesday, I wrote this sermon. And Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, it was God showing me one way after, uh, after another, you need a good dose of humility. <laughs> Same thing I was thinking about those, those other pastors. So this, this sermon gets a little long. I've edited it quite a bit. If you'd like to see the whole thing, it's available on the church website. But um, I'd like to look at 1 Peter 5, verse 6, but I want to back up to verse 5, which wasn't in our reading today. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, because God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Clothe yourselves with humility. Humble yourselves. So I, I want to look at the power of humility, and I want to look at the burden of pride, and to do that, I want to take a pride test. Everybody's going to take a pride test. There's 10 things. If you answer yes to any of these questions, give yourself one point. First question, do you, do you long for a lot of attention? Okay, and some people do this, you know, by, by being needy and clingy and, you know, uh, putting on that pathetic look and you can say something wrong and they say, yeah, how did you know? I said, well, probably that big billboard you're carrying around. Or, or some people do it by, by being loud and vocal, you know, and they gotta be the center of attention. How about you? Do you need that attention? If so, give yourself one point. Second, do you become jealous or critical of people who succeed? We were at an athletic event a few months ago. It was back during the winter. And um, at the end of the event, they announced the winners and they put a podium out in, in the gym and you know, there's third place, a little bit higher second place, then higher in the middle is first place. And they announced third place, and they announced second place, and they announced first place. And everybody applauds. When they announce first place, the person clapping louder and harder and longer than anyone else in the whole gym was the person standing in second place on the podium. I was proud of the kid in first place because he was mine. I was proud of the kid in second place because the world needs more people like him. He was clapping the loudest for the person that beat him in the competition. If we could learn to rejoice with other people's rejoicing instead of letting our pride make us jealous and critical, the world would be a lot better place. Do you get jealous of other people who, who succeed? Give yourself a point. Number three, do you always have to win? I, I'll, I gotta tell you, I hate to lose. I, ha I hate to lose it. Cribbage, I hate to lose it. 500, I hate to lose it. Sports, I hate to lose. I'm married into the right family though because everyone in Brenda's family hates to lose too. I remember we were, one of the first times I went up there, and we were playing 500 with her grandparents. 500 is a card game, for those of you who may not know. And Brenda's grandfather was this mild-mannered, quiet guy. And at one point, after we, we beat him, he said to his wife, who was his partner, why did you play that? That was stupid. <laughs> and then there's other times we were playing, Brenda and I were playing 500 against Brenda's uncle, Vern Gunderman, and I forget, one of his kids. And and he's a very good card player, very competitive, but a very nice pastor. And Brenda and I just beat the stew out of him. And he said, well, of course you won. You don't even have to have brains to win with cards like that. Okay. And in, in my family, as a kid, the Monopoly game was not over until the board and all the pieces were knocked off onto the floor. Okay. Um, I, 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 I like to win. I know, I know that there's no ESPN highlight reel for best Monopoly move of the week, but I like to win. You know, do you have to win? So give yourself a point. Number four, 
we'll speed up a little bit here. Do you have a pattern of lying? You know, not, not big lies, just those little lies that make yourself look a little better in someone else's eyes. That's pride at work. So if, if you've ever done that, give yourself a point. And then my personal favorite, number five. Do you have a hard time acknowledging that you are wrong? Raise your hand. Do you have a hard time being wrong? Okay. Yeah. And if you're, I mean, if you were caught and proved wrong, you still find a way to blame it on something else or blame it on the, the person that's pointing out that you are wrong. If that's you, give yourself a point. Right. Do you have a lot of conflict with people? Something I've noticed about proud people and humble people um, is that there are a lot of conflicts between proud people and proud people. They just go at each other. And there are conflicts between proud people and humble people. We see this in the life of Jesus. Jesus lived with perfect humility, yet he found himself in constant conflict with the prideful. But what you don't see is conflict between humble people and humble people. It just doesn't happen. You know, there is no, oh, those humble people, they're always going at it. Those humble people, they're always the ones starting the wars. No, it doesn't happen. So if you're in a lot of conflict, maybe you're the proud person. Maybe you're the humble person. Likely you're the proud person. So give yourself a point. Do you ever, number seven, do you ever cut in line? Grocery store? Uh, interstate, you know, or has three lanes narrowing down to two and they tell you a mile ahead to get in the center lane, but you take that lane that no one's in so you can get all the way up to the front and then cut in line? Or how about at the airport? You know, if you want to see proof of original sin, get on the interstate during rush hour or go on an airplane flight. Um, particularly people, watch people getting on the plane and getting off. Everybody wants to budge to the front to save that five seconds that they're just going to use sitting on the plane. Or then the plane lands, and what's everybody do? They stand up because they don't want somebody getting off in front of them because Lord knows that five seconds is important. But yeah, so do you do that? Give yourself a point. Um, number eight, do you, get, do you get upset when people don't recognize your achievements or are properly thankful for something you've done for them? Yeah? <laughs> Give yourself a point. You know, we've got this Jesus who says, uh, talks a, a, teaches this as a parable. It says, don't expect thanks and gratitude. You're just doing what you're supposed to be doing. And instead, we're told to wait for that one who will eventually say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. But that doesn't happen until we die. Okay? So if, you're, if you ever feel slighted because you didn't get the proper recognition or the proper thanks, give yourself a point. Two more. Do you, uh, do you tend more towards an attitude of thankfulness or an attitude of entitlement? No. I, I deserve what I got. Is that it? Or I am so blessed to have what I have. Um, as a, as after having been pastor here for 20 years, there's a number of people that stand out for me in this regard. I'm going to name two. One was a lady named Doris Fries. I think she lived to be 101 or 102. She lived over on 6th Street. She was confined to her home because her arthritis in her knees and her hands were so bad. And I'd go visit her, and she'd be sitting there with her, her feet are up on the ottoman because her knees hurt, and her hands are in braces because of arthritis. And she would spend the time we were together telling me, how thankful she was and how blessed her life was. And I, that, that became sort of a model for me that I have never quite been able to aspire to. And the, the other is Helen Benson, 103 years old, um, can't see hardly at all, and yet when I visit her, it's just a half hour or an hour of her telling me how blessed her life is. And I think that's such a great model for us. And it's, it's one of those things that leads us away from pride more to that attitude of thankfulness that comes with humility. So if you're, if you're more entitled than you are thankful, give yourself a point. And then last one, do you honestly feel that you're basically a good person? I mean, you're, you're not gonna wear a t-shirt that says I'm better than most people, but don't you sometimes think that in your head that the world's just full of stupid people who aren't as smart as I am, or just full of bad people who aren't as good as I am? I mean, if you think that, give yourself a point. Um, that was 10 questions. If you scored between 1 and 10, you have a pride problem. If you scored a 0, you have a big pride problem. Okay? 
And the Bible talks a lot. The Bible talks a lot about pride and humility. The verse we read at the start of worship. Nope, go back one. Clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand. Get this, Peter's driving this home. Then look at Proverbs. Next slide. Proverbs 8, this is God talking. I hate pride and arrogance. I hate it, God says. Now, I, I don't approve of it. It's not, I'm not favorably disposed to it. It's not, it bothers me. God says, I hate pride and arrogance. As far as I know, this is the only place in the Bible where God says, I hate something. And what God hates is pride. Another verse from Proverbs, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. That means if you're dealing with pride, you've got a big fall coming. You've got those days coming when God says, you need a good dose of humility. James 4, he gives us more grace. That's why scripture said, God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Another one, Luke 14, this is Jesus talking. This is the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. For all those who, nope, for all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. All right, so how do you work on humility? Number one, if you want to grow in humility, don't focus on humility. Don't focus on yourself. Think about it a minute. If you think, all right, I'm a prideful person. I need to grow in humility, so I'm better. So I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, and I'm going to do that, this, and then I'll be more humble the way I'm supposed to be. That's all self-centered. That's just pride at work. Instead of focusing on humility and focusing on yourself, you fo to get humility, you focus on other people, and the other person you start with is Jesus. I mean, look at Jesus. He lived his life in perfect humility. Was Jesus humble? Yeah. Most humble person that ever lived. Um, Jesus, everything he did was directed away from himself and directed at other people. That's what humility does in us. So if we want to grow in humility. We don't focus on ourselves. We focus on Jesus. And then we focus on how we can be used by God to be, to be, to be his humble servants. But And I know, I know that there's some of us who hear that and we say, yeah, but I want to do something. I want to make a difference. No one's done more than Jesus. No one's done, made a bigger difference than Jesus. More books written about him than any other human, more songs written about him than any other human, more paintings of him than any other human. Um, even our calendar revolves around the day he was born. We have B.C. before Christ and A.D., year of our Lord. Our whole calendar is about Jesus. We turn his birthday into a, a holiday, but not just a holiday. We turn it into an event that we celebrate for a month or more. Uh, call it the Christmas season. All of this for a person who is perfectly humble. Do you have trouble wrapping your head around this? You know, Paul, let me read that verse from Go ahead and put Philip. Oh, never mind. I forgot the last seven points of my sermon. <laughs> I, I've got I've I've to buzz through these, okay? They're all on the website. Pride is natural. Humility is a miracle, okay? Pride is something we can do right out of the womb. Mir humility is something God has to work himself in us. Pride covets other success. Humility rejoices in other success. Pride's about being selfish. Humility is about being a servant. Pride is about getting glory. Humility is about giving glory. Pride is independent. We do it on our own. Humility is dependent. We need God doing it in us. Pride is achieved. Humility is a gift. It's part of the grace that God gives us. Pride is about getting our way. Humility is about getting God's way. And then we have, we have Paul, who would develop this in the book of Philippians. He says, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. We hear all this stuff about humility, and it leaves us feeling like we failed. We're we're horrible people. And you know, that, that's the law at work. That's what the law is supposed to do for us. 
but we can never leave it at the law. See, we have this one who wasn't just an example of humility. We have this one who went to us, went to the cross for us with all of our pride, all of our self-centeredness, all of our ego, knowing all of that about us. Jesus lived perfectly and died innocently at the cross for us and calls us forgiven. And the, the more we spend time in the shadow of the cross, we, the more we spend time going to that cross in repentance and telling Jesus we need that forgiveness, the more like Jesus we become and the more humble we become. Then we begin to be powerful. And then we begin to make a difference, not through our own strength, but through our humility, showing others God's strength. See, people shouldn't look at Christians and think what wonderful people they are. That's not our role. People are to look at Christians and see how wonderful God is. God works that in us through the fruit of humility. Amen and amen. Let's stand up now and confess our sins. I'm sorry, confess our faith through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We worship the Lord now with our offerings. class of 2023 to come forward and Bustina will join us. And then we have, t there are 10 of you, but not all 10 were able to join us today. But if you'd come and stand up here and face the congregation. Um, we do not have a microphone up here, so I'm going to repeat what you say uh, so that the people that are watching online can hear it. But um, I'll start down there with you. Aiden, what, what are your plans? You're graduating from where? Uh, Champlain Park High School. Champlain Park High School, what are your future plans? Um, I think I'm planning on going into uh, computer science. Computer science, all right, very good. Caitlin Kaiseth, graduating from? Columbia Heights. Graduating from Columbia Heights and going to Montana Tech. Mining and engineering, right? Yep. You just want to use dynamite to blow stuff up, right? Yeah, okay. All right. Josh, graduated from St. Anthony, and what plans are? Michigan Tech for audio production. Michigan Tech for audio productions, up in the UP. All right. PJ. Graduating from Totino Grace, going to Mankato State for automotive engineering. 
All right, so graduating from Totino Grace, going to Mankato State for automotive engineering. Very good. Will? Graduating from Concordia Academy. Concordia Academy, graduating. And going to Concordia St. Paul to study exercise science. Exercise science at Concordia St. Paul, and we'll also run track at Concordia. All right. And then we are missing um, Leah Hansen, who's going gra graduating from Irondale? Irondale, and going to River Falls. Um, we're missing... Connor, who's graduating from Columbia High, at Fridley, and going to? Uh, I think he has some plans to um, train dogs. All right, to be a dog trainer. Uh, Grant Gilderhoos is also graduating from Columbia Heights. I don't know what his plans are. Janoop? Okay, and what are his plans for next year? Don't know yet. All right, undecided. All right, so that's six. Nope, who, who did I miss? <coughs> Noel Eckert. Uh, Noel is graduating from Alternative Learning School, and currently, Noel's future plans are to work at Davis Christian Learning Center as, a, as an aide, and she's really doing a wonderful job of that. All right, we have uh, a couple things. We have a gift for you that Faustina will give you when worship's over. Also, when worship's over, I'd like you to stand in the back so that people can greet you, and then we're going to have cake outside. All right, Faustina has... Yep has taken care of that too. All right, so let me pray for all of you. Father, we thank you for these graduates, for the ones who are here and the, the ones who couldn't be here. And we ask your blessing upon them, Lord. We pray that as they move into those next big stages of their life, that your spirit rests on them and that you guide their every step in a way that no matter what vocation they are in, they find a way to glorify you doing that. We ask your blessing, Lord, upon parents that are sending these kids off, um, maybe with a little bit of fear and trepidation, and we pray that you give that perfect peace to the parents of these kids as well. And for siblings who will miss their brother or their sister, we pray that you would bless them with all that they need. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right, you may go to your seats for now and then join me in the back. All right, make sure to send me a picture and I'll get it in the slideshow. In our prayers today, I once again ask you to pray for Brenda's father, Glenn Gunderman. Um, he was diagnosed with lung cancer last year and they think they've got that under control, but more recently he was diagnosed with um, a cancerous tumor on his adrenal gland and he'll begin radiation for that soon. So we pray for him. Let's pray. Oh, Lord Jesus, you not only show us what it means to be a humble servant, you do what no other humble servant can do. You became obedient to death, even death on a cross, so that we could be forgiven and righteous and holy. And we pray, Lord, that we could, we could never take that for granted, but that we could spend time sitting at the foot of the cross, sitting in the shadow of the cross, recognizing just how much you've done for us. And let that be used by your Holy Spirit to grow humility in us. We pray this, Lord, for ourselves as individuals, but also churches can, de can deal with pride as well. So we pray that as a church, we would be a humble people, known by love, who live by faith, who are a voice of hope. And as we, as we leave worship and go out into a world where people carry the burdens of poverty and homelessness, where people deal with the burdens caused by bigotry and hatred and racism, or the, or the burdens caused by violence or war or terrorism, we pray, Lord, that we go as those humble people who bring peace and who bring justice and who are a voice of hope. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. we pray for those who await your healing. We pray for Glenn Gunderman. Uh, we pray for Larry Betzel, Lord, that you'd cause that kidney to work. Uh, thank you that it's working a little, and we pray that you'd just move that kid kidney along so that he can live a life of full health and full service to you. And we pray for uh, all those that we name silently before you. Father, work your miraculous healing by your grace and by your perfect will in the lives of these. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Pray for people confined to their homes and nursing homes. For Lester Rudd, Wanda Heinig, Phyllis Kroll, Anna Hers. Comfort these, Lord, with your very presence. 
Assure them that they're loved by you and use, use them in ways of humility right where they are. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for other churches today. We pray for, um, we pray for Community United Methodist Church, which is now closed, and their members had their closing service last week, and they move now into a partnership with another church. We pray that you'd bless them. We pray that you bless the church that's going to be occupying their building, that your kingdom may grow and spread throughout Columbia Heights. Lord, in your mercy. And as we pray for our own church, Father, we, we not only thank you for these 10 graduates, we thank you for every person you put at St. Matthew, and we pray that all of us would be those faithful, humble servants who work in your powerful ways. We pray, Lord, for whoever it is that you have in mind to lead worship musically at St. Matthew, and we pray, Lord, that you raise them up, make them known to us, and, and, and that we might move forward in the ways you want us to move forward. And Lord, as we as a church uh, take on the, the possibility of taking on a large debt in order to fix a boiler, we pray that we as your people would respond with generosity. Lord, in your mercy. We pray all these things knowing that you hear them, for we ask them in the name of Jesus. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's take some time to ponder and reflect on what it is that we are doing when we come to the communion rail and receive the Lord's Supper. Jesus says of this, this is my body, this is my blood, this is for the forgiveness of sins. You know, we can't see that. We can't reason that one out. We can't put this under a microscope and find the body of Jesus or the blood of Jesus. But Jesus says it, and so we take him at his word and we come believing in a way we can't see or understand. Jesus is truly present and he's present to forgive our sins. If that's what you believe, you're invited and encouraged to join us. And we set apart this holy meal for God's holy use with God's own holy word. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the New Testament, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. If you are taking communion in your pew, take and eat the body of Christ. Take and drink the blood of Christ, shed for you for the full and free forgiveness of all your sins.
Now may this true body and blood of our Lord Jesus strengthen you and preserve you in true faith to life everlasting. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, we do give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you come and you refresh us and you grow us in Christ's likeness through the body and blood of Christ. We pray, Lord, that as we go out, we go out as your humble servants, loving you with heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving our neighbors as we love ourselves. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Jesus said, I'm going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. Please rise for the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God's people say, Amen. Amen. Amen.